Well, welcome. Thank you so much for coming out today and for those who are participating on Zoom. Um, my name is Jewel Ratzlaff and I am the Big Read Coordinator for the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. And this is our 14th year coordinating the community-wide reading program in the fall. Uh, this year we're focusing on the book Lab Girl written by Hope Jarin. And it is a, both a memoir and some really fascinating chapters on the natural world, whether it's trees, seeds, roots, etc. cetera. Um, I, I want to make sure that everybody gets a brochure and inside the brochure that you know there is a full calendar of events and all of that is um, for you, as well as the credits to our supporters and our partners. Um, this is a group effort. The Big Read is definitely a group effort with many, many schools, many libraries, the colleges, arts organizations, literacy organizations, civic organizations, um, and in this particular case, lots of environmental organizations participating in this year's Big Read. Um, so those partners are listed on the back as well as our financial supporters, um, chief of which is the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, this is an NEA uh, program supported by their grant funding. Um, for those on Zoom, I'd just like to ask you to keep your microphones muted. Uh, there will be a time of question and answer towards the end. So those of you in the room will be able to ask questions easily. Those on Zoom can enter your questions into the chat box and I will collect those and we'll share them with our speaker today. Which brings me to the introduction to Dr. Lynn Christensen. She teaches at Vassar College, biology, ecology, ecosystems, ecology, and um, more, I think. Yeah, I'll tell you more. <laughs> All right. Um, so when I was looking for a, um, a speaker to kick off this year's big read, within the course of a week, I had three people recommend Dr. Lynn Christensen, have you talked to her? And uh, so it was it was really wonderful. And I just felt like, oh yes, this must be the person. And then I took a look at her photo on the Vassar College website and thought, why well, she even sort of looks like Hope Jarring. <laughs> um, but their research is very similar and I think perhaps career path as well. Um, so I am definitely looking forward to um, Lynn's presentation today to kind of give us an insider look of what it takes to become a scientist. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lynn Christensen. Thanks, Jewel, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Again, I was uh, saying to one of my colleagues in the back, Edie, uh, that uh, these are always like wonderful to agree to. You're, you get invited and you say yes about five months ago and then the time keeps ticking on and then it's like it's here and you're going like, why did I say yes? Yeah. But, <laughs> but I say yes because it's wonderful to see you in the audience and for those of you on Zoom, um, I hope that this is a little bit of an insider discussion of becoming a scientist. Um, so I don't know if we want to go to share screen and pull up the presentation. I, I will if I know go I there and there we are. Excellent. You're becoming a pro at this. <laughs> and now everybody is there we go from the beginning. Yeah, there we are. And I think uh, well, where are we? I think maybe if we go down to uh, over on the right over here. Is it that little guy? This little guy? Is it this one? <laughs> yeah, that one. Oh, no, no. That, that one. Slideshow. Excellent. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Uh, and hopefully, those of you on Zoom uh, participating remotely, you can see this. And if you can't, lodge your uh, complaints and requests with Jewel afterwards. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's wonderful to be here, everybody. And when I got invited, I had had before a number of colleagues and, and friends say to me, have you read Lab Girl? Have you read Lab Girl? 
And I kept saying no. And I was like, eh, I don't really want to read this book. Um, and I, it was like, lab girl, really? Uh, and I had heard good things. They said, no, this is really a great book. And I was like, OK. So then when Jewel contacted me, <laughs> And she said, would you be the speaker for we're reading Lab Girl? I'm like, oh, really? I'm like, OK, yes, yes, this sounds like a great idea. And so I have to admit that when I got the book and I started reading it, although I got the book much earlier, I didn't start reading it until June. And um, I got through the first chapter and the second chapter. I was like, uh, I was, you know, I'm like, OK, where's this going? But then I really appreciated Hope Jaren's story about her life as a scientist, first as a young person spending time with her dad in his lab. He was a scientist. That's where our careers diverge right from the very beginning. I'll tell you a little bit about that in just a second. Um, but then you started getting into her book. And first of all, she's an amazing writer. I would only hope to be able to write like she does. Maybe it's someday in my future retirement, I too will write a book, although I'm not exactly sure what it'll be yet. Um, but her accounting of her life, and I think that's one of the most important things to take away from the, her book, is that any of us, no matter what path or what career we choose, it's going to be filled with all of these personal triumphs and trials, and some of us experience different kinds of challenges. And she certainly told us, it gave us a little bit of insight into some of her own personal, personal challenges. Um, and then you can also appreciate some of the humor of the stories that she was telling. I also found the book very remarkably much like, I don't know if any of you have read Tara Westover's Educated. Mm -hmm. The same, I mean, different story, obviously, but there's that similar um, feeling or tone to the overall book. And so I, I was drawing uh, similarities between that. I think my life is not quite as, as dramatic as either of those two. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about becoming a scientist. Uh, as you can see here on this first slide, I study a lot of different organisms. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do and then how did I actually get there. Um, so hopefully you find this enjoyable. And I didn't want to include a whole bunch of stuff. I am going to show you a tiny bit of data to give you a flavor of, I don't think Jewel, uh, pardon me, uh, Hope was able to include that in her book because she didn't show you tables of data. So I'll give you a little flavor for what we as scientists have to deal with sometimes. So to start out, first of all, what am I identified as, as a scientist? Well, I'm a, an ecosystem ecologist and specifically I'm a biogeochemist and I study biogeochemistry in forested systems. And I'll get to a little bit more detail of that in just a, in a second. Um, and here I give you an image of some plots where I am looking at deer browsing in the forest and how the forest responds to this big herbivore. I also am really interested in the atmospheric nitrogen, that's end deposition. Uh, so all this nitrogen that is coming from all of our own activities, like running our automobiles and some of our industrial practices put a lot of extra nitrogen in the environment. If any of you are gardeners, you know that you like to fertilize your plants, your garden, your flowers, and they're going to grow more robustly. Well, what happens when you put a whole lot extra nitrogen in the natural environment? How does it respond? So I'm interested in those kinds of questions. And also, the bottom, if any of you live in an area where there's gypsy moths, so it's an invasive caterpillar species. Uh, it's a lepidopteran insect that was imported into the United States way back a couple hundred years ago. People thought that they could actually produce silk. So they brought this organism into the United States and it's become a little bit of a challenge. So I'm really interested in how some invasive species might be impacting our forests. But I study forests not from the same perspective that Hope does, but from a biogeochemical bio perspective. What does that mean? Essentially, we're accountants. Um, so if you think about, you know, we're just glorified natural accountants, um, where an accountant is going to track the dollars in, dollars out. What did you buy? What do you have to budget for? Do you have to pay the mortgage? Does the roof fall off your house? Do you have to replace the shingles? You know, whatever those things are, the car breaks down, I need new tires. What's my income? 
Uh, so you have a balance sheet. And essentially, as a biogeochemist, I particularly study carbon and nitrogen. Those are two elements of big significance to how a forest works. We all know carbon is necessary for trees to grow, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Nitrogen, really important so that these plants can grow vigorously. But again, there are balances, right? Um, so what we do is we go out and we measure lots of stuff. So we measure leaves, we measure soil, we measure, and something I am well known for is I follow poop. So uh, I, I am not a scatologist in that I try to identify what the poop is. I go put the poop out there on, my, uh, on purpose. And then I figure out where it's going to go in the environment. So this is an example of sort of a balance sheet, if you will. So this is what we end up doing as biogeochemists who study the ecosystem and all the connections. And so Hope, in her book, gave us some really great examples of how she studies her questions and the kinds of instruments she uses. And I have to say, a lot of what she ends up doing are these balance sheets as well. So I do this for things like gypsy moths. How does a gypsy moth eating leaves in a tree and pooping on the ground, how does that affect the forest? And where is the carbon and the nitrogen from that insect defoliation event going to go in the environment? So that's one of the things that I do as a forest ecologist. Now, I don't only study little animals and little poop, but I study big animals and big poop too. <laughs> Uh, and I have a lot of colleagues who study some really large animals like elephants, and I've kind of always wanted to, I'm jealous of them going off to Africa and studying elephant poop. Um, but I'm very happy studying moose poop uh, here in North America. And so it's the same idea where we go out and we measure all of these different places where we think nitrogen and carbon would be moving. In the trees, in the soil, in the animals who live in the soil. Uh, all throughout uh, the environment. And one thing that's really important about studying uh, the environment is the scale at which you study the environment. So does something happen on a small scale or can we kind of expand that to extrapolate up to the large scale? And so we end up doing a lot of calculations like this where we take our findings from a very small scale and then to understand if what we're doing is significant or not, we'll, we'll do what we call scaling up. So on this and the last image you saw in the purple letters, there's something that's called 1HA, so that's a hectare. So we are science folks, and so we speak in, in a uh, metric language. So we have 1 hectare, 11 hectares, and 3,000 hectares. And again, as accountants of nitrogen and carbon in the environment and the different forms that it might take, we measure that. So we use a lot of um, instruments in the lab uh, so here's where the lab girl part comes in. Uh, and we take those samples from outside, we bring them in, and then we have to use all of our chemical uh, finesse and technology to run these instruments to get the numbers out. So again, very similar to what Hope was describing as some of the basic work that she does and what has allowed her to answer some of her questions. So the other thing that I'm interested in, Hope was very interested in plants and trees and kind of going back in time. I'm interested in kind of right now, what are animals doing to their environment and how do animals affect these nutrient cycling uh, cycles and how do they affect decomposition? We all know that when stuff dies, it has to decompose. If we didn't have decomposition, we'd be buried, we, we'd be done. Um, so decomposition is a really important process. So I look at how animals affect decomposition and how they're a really part, important part about that. And I had to put this picture in because I had to demonstrate how much poop I've collected for uh, uh, So as a scientist, yes, that is a table full of poop um, and not just any poop. So here's where I hope that you enjoyed um, some of Hope Jarvin's descriptions of her out collecting her samples. Um, the one in, uh, I believe it was in the UK, when they smashed the car mirror and they were going out and doing the moss collections and they had a problem with it or something like that. So we too, I think every scientist who collects field samples encounters some sort of challenge. And so my story from this poop 
that poop was produced in Alaska. And it was very special poop. Um, to study an element in the environment, if you think about carbon, there's a lot of it around, right? And nitrogen, there's actually a lot of it around. So what we end up doing is we try to figure out a way to follow or track its movement inside this great big pool. And we do that using heavy isotopes. These are natural isotopes of the elements that just have a slightly different mass. And one of the things that Hope Jarvin uses in her research is mass spectrometry. And we do exactly the same thing. So we have a specialized instrument uh, that can determine these slight mass differences. Again, this is all accounting, but as uh, Hope described, she had a great person in her life whom she met very early on, Bill, who was her technician, essentially. He was her um, counterpart to run that really complicated instrument and get good numbers from it. Um, so I cannot uh, underemphasize how important working with somebody like that is. An instrument is a, has a mind of its own. So if you've ever had your computer or your car do something weird on you, you take it to a mechanic or you take it to the IT specialist. Well, running an instrument that is really trying to determine minute differences between one element form and its isotopic uh, uh, counterpart is really, really challenging. And so we spend a lot of time as scientists trying to make these instruments work well and get valuable data out of it. Um, this takes up a lot of our time. So that poop was, nor was enormously valuable, not only for how much it cost me to make it, um, because I had to add this isotope to plants so that the moose would actually eat it, ingest it, and then what it pooped out had this heavy signature of uh, nitrogen in it. Uh, but that's not even the best part. The best part was I was flying to Alaska. I had to do this twice. So I get to fly to Alaska twice, first in the spring to go label the plants where the moose were going to be eating, and then I had to go back in the fall to go let the moose in to eat those plants. And then I had to walk behind the moose all day to collect the food. <laughs> but that's not even the best part yet. So it's really fun to be a scientist doing this stuff. Uh, and once I collected all that poop, I had to get it back to New Hampshire because that's where my field, my experimental plots were. So what do you think the funniest part was about this story? Shipping the poop. So I was going to Alaska. I flew in with two empty coolers. That's pretty common for Alaska because lots of people go fishing and hunting. And so lots of people bring empty coolers in, but they pack out coolers filled with fish or moose meat. So when I arrived at the airport with my full coolers, they're like, what's in the coolers? I like moose poop. And they're like, what? And it was like, no, you're kidding us. It's like, no, no, no. And these are two coolers full of moose poop and valuable moose poop because it's got this heavy isotope label in it. And this cost me a lot of money to produce. So security, you know, the security folks are opening up the coolers. They're like, yeah, it's moose poop. It's like, what are you nuts, lady? Um, fortunately, they didn't paw through it too much. It was all very carefully organized and categorized by the time that it had passed through the moose. Because as it's passing through the moose, I'm going to see the signature increase and increase. So I didn't need my moose poop all messed with. Um, <laughs> luckily, my moose poop made it all the way uh, and it went out into the field, which that past slide showing you the balance, the accounting sheet, the only way I was able to do that is having that labeled moose poop that I could now dump on my plots and follow it through the rest of the environment. Mm -hmm. And it's that isotope that allowed me to create those kinds of figures. So a lot of effort goes into actually collecting that kind of data. And you gotta admit, it's kind of fun. Um, so not only am I interested in how animals uh, are affecting um, decomposition and nutrient cycling, but I'm also interested in how climate change affects how animals behave. And one of the things I've done in the past is I've manipulated snow depth to see, well, do moose. So one of my favorite animals are moose. And I just happened to be able to study and understand how moose uh, experienced the northern forest at a really cool place in New Hampshire. Whoa, I, 
Oh, hang on. There we go. Okay. Um, and up in New Hampshire, uh, I ended up doing another crazy thing. I went through the woods on a snowmobile up a mountain, and then when I couldn't go any further, then I snowshoed up a mountain. And do any of you like shoveling snow in your driveway? No. Oh, nice, nice. Some people enjoy snow shoveling. Well, so we would snowmobile, snowshoe, get to our sites, and then we would shovel snow in the middle of nowhere on top of a mountain. Um, and so you had to be dedicated to want to do this. And what I was trying to understand was how do moose who are moving through the forest, as climate is changing, if any of you really like snowshoeing or skiing, you know that we haven't had the best snow lately. It's probably been 20 years since we've had good dependable snow. So we are impacted. Maybe some of you are happy you don't have to shovel snow. Maybe some of you don't like snowshoeing or skiing or anything like that. Um, well, moose are experiencing these kinds of environmental conditions very similarly. So I wanted to find out if moose have less snow in the environment, are they going to eat more trees? Because if you think about it, snow protects trees in the wintertime. So very few animals can go digging through the snow to find those plants. So that's what I was doing. I was shoveling snow in the middle of the woods. So that's just sort of a brief tour of some of the research that I do and some of the similarities and the challenges that we face when we're trying to do this work uh, as scientists. And of course, to be a scientist also means you are either, as Hope described in her book, um, she's a research scientist. Yes, she teaches some students, but that's not the principal part of her, her job. Her job really is to get grants and to do her research. Many of us kind of have a balance between teaching and doing our research. And so, as I was introduced, I'm at Vassar College where I'm a professor and I get to teach all these great students. Um, and so some of you might be educators yourself. And we know that one of the best sort of joys uh, of, of sort of our, our life is to teach other people what we know um, and to allow them to explore science in a way that is unique to them. And so I think that's one of the other things that I don't know if it really totally comes across in Hope's book, but science and becoming a scientist is not about learning facts, as I think many students are trained uh, these days where uh, you memorize a book. That's not what science is. Science is really about curiosity and developing good questions and questioning the world around you and wanting to make observations around, uh, about you, uh, up, up in the world around you. Uh, and I think that comes through in Hope's book, how she was driven by curiosity. And for her, it started in her dad's lab and she just had this wonderful curiosity and nobody tried to change that and nobody tried to, in my words, squash that. Um, maybe a few people tried, um, but they didn't mean it. They didn't really mean to do that. But I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves that when we're teaching students, we have to let them kind of run with their ideas and support them in their ideas. Uh, and that's what I really, really like about teaching students at Vassar College is that we get to let these students run with their ideas and give them the opportunity to ask crazy questions. Um, this, that, that's, we should all be asking crazy questions um, and we should be ultimately curious. So that's one of the things that I loved about Hope's book, her innate curiosity in the things that really meant a lot to her and how she approached them. So that's what I really like about this. So now you know that I'm a biogeochemist, I'm an ecosystem ecologist, and I'm a teacher, I'm a professor. But how did I get there? Um, so just like hope for all of us, um, it's a pretty twisty, windy path. It's not a direct line. Very few people that I know who are scientists follow a direct line. Maybe a few people do, but very few. There's always some diversion along the way. And again, just like everybody in life, you know, it's going to be filled with choices. Um, each of us makes a choice. And I suppose one of the things that I always try to instill in my students, it doesn't matter what your choice is. It's not right or wrong. You made a choice. Go with it. Don't look back and regret a choice. Just say, hey, I made a choice and, and I'm moving on this path. And I might come back to that other fork in the road later on. 
or if I don't, it's okay. Um, I think that's one of the greatest, again, gifts about being a scientist is not regretting any of your choices. I think they lead to a whole host of other questions. And it's hard. Uh, let's let's not be uh, you know light here. It's it's definitely hard work. Just as any of us who has a job, um, some jobs may be different, uh, and, but they all have their share of hardship. And so there's a lot of tedious stuff that goes on. And again, I think Hope describes some of the tedium of packing those little vials, um, and then they all explode. Uh, so again, there are these challenges that sometimes we make a misstep and we have to go back and do something all over again. So it's choices, hard work, failure. Uh, I think talking to any scientist, all scientists fail. Um, and we have a lot of failures, whether it's our experiments, whether it was the kind of question we asked, uh, submitting a paper for uh, possible review and publication, submitting a proposal. You have to get used to rejection. You have to get used to people saying, that's a dumb idea. No, Sonia, we've already done that. Or, eh, we don't want to publish your work. Or, no, we're not going to fund your work. So failure is really a key part of being a scientist. Um, if you can't handle failure, this is not the field for you. Um, you have to be willing to have people tell you your work is worthless, and then you go away and you uh, uh, you essentially say how dumb you are for either a week or a day, or it gets easier. It actually gets way easier. Um, I think my first failures, it probably took me weeks to recover from it. Uh, and then it got easier. So uh, to the point where you finally go, what do you know? Um, you, you just, you, that's an, an, an opinion. Um, I know that my methods were sound. I know that I did robust work. I documented everything that I did. And I believe that my result is valid and valuable. And if you believe that as a scientist, ultimately people will start to listen to you. And I think that's the other part about being a scientist. If you think you've done something, like again, I love her description in her book when she was the only person who knew this one thing, working late in the lab and she had found this out and then it was like, it was hers for that night, but then she got to start to share it. But then people started to say, yeah, that's, that's not so important. Um, but she stuck with it. And I think that's the other big message about being a scientist. Stick with what you believe that you are contributing to the field. And you've got clearly successes. So ultimately, she has been successful. All scientists have successes. We publish stuff. We teach our students. We get funding. We do a cool experiment and we learn something new. Um, sometimes what we contribute might build something and that serves the public and society in a great way. Otherwise, we are all contributing as scientists. We're contributing to that body of knowledge that others can take and grow and build from. So no matter what, all scientists have some form of success in their careers. And of course, it's got to be fun. Um, and so the challenges that we face as scientists, again, just like everybody else in their careers, um, are immense. But you have to have fun. And being a scientist, you do end up having a lot of fun. So being a scientist can take many, many forms. And where my story diverges from Hope's is she talked about why she became a scientist. And she became a scientist because she spent a lot of time with her dad in his lab, and it was her refuge, and she was intimately curious about all the stuff that he had in his lab. Um, and she developed her uh, interest from that point forward. For me, it was a little bit different. Um, I grew up in central Canada, and I actually, you, this audience probably will mostly remember, do you guys remember Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. That was our programming every Sunday night and Jacques Cousteau underwater, and yeah, 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 yeah. And Disney, I think, was on on Sunday too. Um, and so those programs, as well as my family had this set of African wildlife encyclopedias. I have, to this day, I have no idea where they came from, but they were in the house. And I memorized all these African animals. And mostly Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom 
they did a little bit of North American animals, but there was very much an African centric focus. And so I was enamored with African wildlife. I loved wildlife. Um, and so I wanted to be a wildlife biologist. And I know in Hope's book, she described um, some of the challenges she faced as a woman in science. And I too faced those challenges where I really wanted to be a wildlife biologist, although I had no idea what that meant or how I was going to be that person. Um, and when I got to university, it was very clear from my professors, who were mostly male, um, that well, you probably want to study botany. You probably want to study plants. I was like, no, I want to be a wildlife biologist. I want to be a conservation biologist. Well, you probably want to study plants. And they really steered us towards botany, which I'm very thankful that I got to study a little bit of botany. And in the long run, studying moose and deer and all these other animals, I came back to wildlife, but sort of in a backward or a back door. Um, so I was dissuaded from pursuing being a wildlife biologist, but I always like to say that I kind of came back to it. Um, so as a female in science, we are sometimes faced with uh, some different ideas about what uh, is expected of us. And uh, I think today that still exists, but not to the same degree that it did for many of us in this room. Uh, and certainly as Hope points out. One challenge that does remain for female scientists is raising a family and having children. Um, I think I just saw this morning, and this is more general with COVID, where women right now who have kids at home who have to be learning online, they're dropping out of the workforce because they just can't manage this. This is enormously challenging. Um, it's not to say that their spouses, if they're male, are not suffering some of those same consequences, but typically it's women who drop out of the workforce. And it's definitely women who drop out of science once they have a family. There's not the same kind of support for women in science or any career, especially once you start to get up into higher levels. There is still this amazing bias in how women are expected to behave and expected to sort of run the house and take care of the family, whether it's your extended family or not. So even though it's a little easier and now women are wildlife biologists and women are in these fields, uh, they still face a lot of challenges. So we still a lot of, have a lot of work to do um, as the people that we support and, and how we vote. And the other place where I think I diverge a little bit from uh, Hope Jarn's uh, experiences is the place where I grew up. Now, I totally identified with Northern Minnesota. So I grew up in a place called Flinsland, and yes, it's a real town, in central Manitoba. It's just uh, south of the low Arctic Circle. Um, so you can imagine it's very cold. So I identify with cold climates. It's very interesting. I loved African wildlife, but I never wanted to be a um, tropical ecologist. I don't really like the hot heat and humidity. I do love the cold. I do love the snow and I do love um, the boreal forest. And so the fact that I'm an ecologist who studies northern temperate forest and I shoveled snow on the top of a mountain comes from where I came from. And uh, my grandparents lived in this northern mining town called Flin Flon. And so I was exposed to people who worked in the mine and people who were loggers. Um, there were some farmers in the family and there were some trappers in the family. So I was very closely aware of the environment around me and some of the challenges that that environment was facing. And I have no idea where I had my ethic from, but I would fight my family all the time. I debated. I remember being 12 years old and arguing that it was terrible that they were chopping down trees and it was terrible that they were trapping animals. Um, and I had no idea where that came from because they, that's how they sustain themselves. That's how they made a living. Um, and somewhere in me, I had to debate and fight about that with them. Um, luckily, my family still talks to me, so, so that's, that's okay. Um, but Taking those two mutual of Omaha's wild kingdom, I somehow wanted to be a wildlife biologist and I wanted to be that person who stood in the field writing notebook, writing in a notebook. 
and then studying the environment around me. Those are the things that helped me go on to university and start to explore and study the things that I studied. So that's what I did when I was in university. But then life has an amazing way of taking a crazy divergent path. So as I was an undergraduate, I all of a sudden met my husband, my future husband, at a snake den. And when I tell when I tell students when I tell students that I met my husband in a snake pit, they're like, "What is that a bar?" Um, I was like, "No, a real snake pit, a real snake den." So again, I said I was from Central Manitoba, and Central Manitoba is famous for these hibernacula, um, these places where red-sided garter snakes, and it's called the Narcissus snake dens. It's a wildlife management area, um, and I worked there as a park interpreter for a couple of summers. And there was this crew from the University of Texas at Austin who were doing research on temperature dependent sex determination. And this guy who was a Vassar grad walked through the door of the field station, which was an old farmhouse. We had no running water. We had electricity in this old farmhouse. And upstairs is where everybody slept with just a bunch of mattresses on the floor. And everybody just went out every day and did their research, did their work. And we all lived in this house for the summer. And I got to know this guy. And this guy turned out to be pretty cool, I thought. And by the time, I, so he was a graduate student. He was working on his PhD at the University of Texas at Austin in a really famous lab, David Cruz, uh, studying endocrinology. And, uh, and so at the end of my undergrad, when I was graduating, it's like, well, we were having now an international relationship. He would go, but he was an American, I was a Canadian, and I would go visit down in Texas whenever I could. Um, and at the end of my undergrad, it was like, well, what are we doing? It's like, well, I'm in grad school, I can't leave. I'm like, well, I guess I could go there. And so I moved to Austin. I really only know this guy for like all told probably out of two years, 60 days. So I really didn't know him. So I was willing to move myself from my country. And I never, ever, ever imagined that I would leave my country. And in some ways, when you think about Hope's journey, she also went from living in the continental United States to Hawaii to Norway. She made changes in her life because of opportunities that presented themselves. And so I think all of us, and scientists in particular, are oftentimes faced with meeting people who change the trajectory of what you thought you were going to be doing. So when I agreed to go to Texas, at that point, I had two job offers out of university. I was either going to go to the Orkney Isles to study climate, um, or I was going to go to Ellesmere Island in the high Arctic, which was sort of a dream. Uh, to go study a relic floral population. And I chose the Vassar grad, who was a grad student, which is really weird for me because when I got the job at Vassar, here I am circling back, and some of my colleagues were my husband's professors, um, which is you just never know what path or where your life is going to lead you. So it is this very circuitous pathway. So these snakes play very highly in my life and in our life together. And we continue to do conservation work together. So um, my husband is Alan Tuzinelli. He's the director of the Trevor Zoo. Um, and that move to the Trevor Zoo meant that when he finished grad school, he said, hey, here's another choice. Um, he finished grad school and he said, I have a postdoc offer in San Diego at the San Diego Zoo, uh, one year postdoc. Mm -hmm. And so a postdoctoral position is once you get your PhD, then you do a next sort of level of training. It's like if any of you know uh, medical doctors, once they get their doctor's degree, they go on and they do a residency. And so it's very similar for a lot of people in the scientific field. You go and do kind of like a residency. Uh, it could be for one year, two years, could be up to five years. So he had an offer to go to San Diego for a year. He also had the potential to go to the London Zoo for five years. I was into that. Um, I was like, let's go to London. Uh, I'm a Canadian, I'm in the Commonwealth, I can work, so this is great. Um, he chose to come to Millbrook, back to Millbrook, New York, um, because he had, when he finished his undergrad at Vassar, 
he had gone to work at the zoo for a few years as he was trying to figure out what he was going to do with his life. And he had an internship at the zoo back when he had graduated as an undergrad himself. And then he went off to grad school and went to Austin. And then our paths crossed. And here we were coming to Millbrook, New York. So I had been in Manitoba to Austin to Millbrook uh, in a span of about six years. And when we got to Millbrook, it's like, great, you've got a job. What am I going to do? And for any of you who know IES, it's now the Cary Institute, the director of the zoo back then, John O'Meggs, knew some of the scientists at the institute, especially Gary Lovett. And Gary Lovett is that gentleman in this uh, photo over here on the left. Peter Grothman is the one in the glasses to the right. And then Gary Lovett is tucked in the back there with his hat on. And Gary Lovett agreed to hire me to work in his lab collecting snow in the Catskill Mountains. And thus began a long career for me at IES, now the Cary Institute. So I continue to be a, um, uh, a visiting scientist at the Institute. And it provided me with this amazing opportunity. I ended up doing both my master's and my PhD out of SUNY ESF. So it's the Environmental College uh, in Syracuse for Science and Forestry. And both Peter Grothman and Gary Lovett were my advisors during that time. So again, I was really keen to go to London. And we ended up in Millbrook. And we arrived in December 1993. And we've been here ever since. So again, the path of a scientist is this remarkable journey. And you just never know what door or what opportunity is going to present itself and when it's going to present itself. And you make a choice. I probably would have been equally as happy going to the Orkney Isles way back and just saying, forget this American guy. Mm -hmm. But today, I'm very happy that that was my choice and my decision. And Hope Jarwin follows a very similar path. She met the person who would be her uh, lab technician for life, Bill, but she also met her husband who was there to support her as well in her scientific endeavors. And clearly that has been a strong combination for her as she's been able to achieve the things she's achieved. So people really matter. And I think that's one of the fun things about being a scientist is that once you have gotten those degrees and everything else, you start to get funding. Just like Hope talked about in her book, funding is really important for a scientist. You need a little bit of money to do that research. So that expensive moose poop, well, Peter Grothman got the money to support that. I was his PhD student, so he had the money. Well, now I've got to get the money for my next group of students. And so just like Hope does, um, we get funding so that we can keep asking our scientific questions. And sometimes you succeed and sometimes you fail. But along the way, you collect a lot of samples. You work with a lot of amazing people. So both your students and some other colleagues. And so I put this slide up because of the Millbrook connection. Um, I don't know here if any of you are familiar with the name Tom Lovejoy. Tom Lovejoy is an amazing uh, global um, uh, ecologist conservationist. Uh, he is the gentleman who coined the word biodiversity way back in the 60s. Um, he has been the director of World Wildlife Fund. He is the gentleman here in the left photo, right in the middle with the blue shirt. And then he's flanked by both my husband and myself and other Millbrook people. Um, so sometimes those locations, those things that you've done in your life, allow you to meet amazing people. And I have a great colleague in the other photo on the right, Melanie Fisk is at uh, Miami, Ohio University. And we love this picture together because we uh, worked on a couple of funded projects together. Uh, we're co-collaborators. Uh, we both dig in the dirt. Clearly, you can see there's a difference between our approaches. We actually have both come out of the field sampling soil. I worked just as hard as she did. I collected just as many samples as she did. But there's a slight difference in our appearance once we have exited the woods and our said soil sampling. I am OCD, uh, so I am definitely obsessive compulsive. I don't 
usually get dirty myself, but I'm very meticulous. Again, it's a quality. Many of my friends and colleagues make fun of me. Um, they even will do things to just mess with me. Um, and you know, it just it's part of the camaraderie ship of working with people. Um, so Melanie is definitely the pig pen to my neat Nick style, but we both have worked very, very hard. And last of all, I would like to say that you know you've made it as a scientist when you get into a children's book. And so I have the fortune of working at what is called an LTER site. It's a long-term ecological research site. It's the Hoverbrook Experimental Forest. It's a National Science Foundation funded long-term research forest. Um, the experimental forest is run by the US Forest Service. And each of these LTR sites, there are a number of them, but they generate or they create these children's books. And a very good friend of mine who works at um, Coverbrook, Nat Clevett, wrote this book. And there is me talking to her, uh, her two protagonists in her story about moose at Hoverbrook in the woods. And, and that's the depiction of me in a children's book. Um, so, yeah, I feel like, okay, I'm maybe I'm not, I'll never be a famous scientist like Tom Lovejoy or Hope Jaren, but I am in a children's book. So I'm pretty happy with, you know, all that I've been able to do so far. Um, well, it's been a lot of fun. I do get to work with big animals like this uh, moose. Her name is Willow. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions mm -hmm. or what your thoughts are. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. I assume that the moose was tame. The tame? Well, you, you know, you, you're, you're collecting poop, so you're going to have to run after them. Yeah, so so actually those moose were, um, they're wild, but they were brought in as orphans. And this is uh, at the Alaska Kenai Moose Research Center. So it's close to Anchorage. And there are, you know, a lot of moose get hit on the road and uh, female moose. And so their calves are typically abandoned. So they bring them to the research center. And they had reared them, so they're still wild, but they're definitely accustomed to people. Um, it's kind of like having a, a, a beef cow rather than a milking cow. So beef cows might be familiar with people, but they'll trample you sometimes. She yeah, was pretty well, nice. That's why I'm, I'm, I was asking because, like like people, animals are sometimes very uh, un, un Yes. You can't, you can't tell what they're going to do. Yeah, well, so you might have seen in that photo, there was another moose behind in another pen. Her name was Annie, and I didn't go in with her. So animals, just like people or your pets, have different personalities. So they all got sort of hand reared as calves, but then they're off doing their thing. And some of them like people more than others. <laughs> and so, yes, Willow was very predictable and she was kind of a nice moose. Um, fortunately, I had also grown up milking dairy cows. Um, so I've been around uh, big Holsteins uh, for a good part of my life. So I was used to getting pushed around by big animals. Um, it was pretty funny when I arrived at the research center, they were the only people who would let me, uh, that's part of the story I didn't tell you, they were the only place I could find where they would let me feed moose this heavy labeled plant material so I could get the labeled poop. Everybody else I contacted was like, no, no, no. I'm like, crap, how am I going to do this? Literally, crap, how am I going to do this? <laughs> um, and uh, and they, they said, sure, why not? We're a research center. Come on out. And so apparently, and they told me this later, when I, you know, I got to Anchorage and then I drove out to the research center and I got out of the rental car and I'm not terribly tall and I'm not terribly big, although I think I'm a really big person. That, but in my mind, I'm like six feet tall, like a lot of my family members, and I'm not. And later on, they said to me, yeah, we were a little worried about you going out and working with these moose. We were like, ah, like, who's this person? And then it, it became evident to them pretty quickly that it's like, oh yeah, you're fine. <laughs> you know how to work with big animals. <laughs> First there. Um, my question to you is when you when you get funding, have you noticed that it has become more difficult over the years for for your research? Yeah, so the question is for those of you on Zoom, um, have I noticed over the years getting funding, is it getting more difficult to get funding? 
Um, that's a great question. Well, here, let me put my National Science Foundation hat on. So I actually was, again, fortunate. I was invited to serve as a program officer, a program director for a year and a half at the National Science Foundation, giving money out. So I got to see the other side. Um, so that's sort of a, maybe a complicated answer. Um, there is the same kind of funding available as there has been uh, over the past, say, 20 years. Um, one of the things that the National Science Foundation tries to do is make sure that all scientists kind of get an equal chance at getting some funding. Again, it's based on the merits of the questions you're asking and the review panel um, uh, approach and procedures. And the, um, the agency is very aware that, you know, there are amazing scientists, like there are labs who are just doing a lot of amazing research. And they submit excellent proposals. And then there are new up and coming scientists, like Hope had said in her book, it's like, wow, you know, I didn't get funding, didn't get funding, then all of a sudden I got funding. So clearly some of her funding, you know, the agency had to make a decision. Do we keep funding those older people like Gary Lovett or Peter Grothman who have been successful for 30 years? Um, they would tell you it's getting harder and they're getting less. But the amount of money going to all investigators, you, we've seen increases, but depending on who the administration is, there are cuts in that sort of overall funding. So it's kind of a messy answer. It's like, um, I think there is still decent funding available, but it is hard because there's a lot of people who are doing really good research and there's only so much money to go around. Yeah. Question in the back. But then how much does the college of your professor support you? Ah, so that's an excellent question. So again, somebody like Hope Jarwin and certainly for Peter Grothman and Gary Lovett, well, not Peter anymore because he's now at CUNY uh, in uh, City of University of New York in, in the city. Uh, many of us, uh, if we are at nonprofit or research institutions where we depend on our research dollars to pay our salaries, yeah, you're work, you're, it's a hustle. Like you're working all the time, writing grant after grant after grant to not only support your technicians and the actual research and maybe fund students, but you're also funding your own salary. And many of those institutions want you to do a 50 or 60% salary recovery. Some of them want you to, to do an 80% salary recovery. That's a tough job, that's, that's tough. And I actually applied for a job. Fortunately, I didn't get it at the Cary Institute. Um, I was, you know, one of the candidates and they gave it to another person, which was awesome. She's amazing. Um, but many of us, yeah. So I feel very comfortable. I mean, Edie, you can say we work very hard as, as professors, um, as we teach our students and serve on committees and everything else, and we still get to do our research. So I still write grants to do my research to support students or to hire a technician to help do the research because I'm teaching, but I don't have to ask for salary recovery. So when I submit a grant, I'm not putting in money to pay for my salary. If anything, and I, um, if I do put in salary, it can only be for three months because as an academic position, we're considered nine months um, and then the summer, and, and that is written in there so that we can write a grant and ask for three months worth of salary um, uh, as somebody who works at an academic institution. And people do, there are different models. Some institutions, yeah, you're on a 12 month appointment. Some say you're on a nine month appointment. So it totally depends on your institution. But yes, being a professor, meaning I get paid by Vassar, that's my salary. So when I submit a grant, I don't have to ask for salary. I put all my budget in student training or teaching my, you know, driving to my field sites, my equipment, my, my cost of doing the science. But will the college help support some of your research groups? So, well, there's a, there's a whole lot of different models. Um, when you first get hired by an institution, so you're starting as a brand new professor, you're going, yes, I got the job. I interviewed, I beat out all these other people. I got the job and you're feeling really good. And then you're feeling even better because typically they give you something that's called a startup salary. And that startup is, it allows you to set up your lab and get your research going. 
And so typically that money lasts for three years and that allows you to jumpstart, kickstart, get your research going, get the equipment you need, do those kinds of projects so they are supporting you with that startup. Once that money goes away, depending on what kind of institution you're at, they might have some money available for you. Vassar, we are very fortunate to be able to apply to different little bits of money, like $5,000 here or $5,000 there, that help support that kind of research. But if we're doing genetic studies or isotopic studies, we need hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that research. So if you think about Hope Jarin's work, and again, any people who do molecular genetic work, they're submitting half a million dollar proposals. I mean, they need half a million dollars. And the big project that I was working on with the um, climate change and snow and nitrogen and everything else, that was a million one project. Mm -hmm. um, it was a big team. So like there were lots of different investigators. So we all had different pools of money, but our proposals going in to the National Science Foundation very few are coming in under $200,000. Most of them are 500 to a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So, and it's funny though, because like we all go like, oh, that's a lot of money. But as soon as you start adding it up, you're like, oh, wow. It's like everything costs money. Um, it's, yeah, you, you very quickly become accustomed to like a million dollars doesn't go that far. <laughs> it's kind of crazy to say that, but a million dollars doesn't go very far. <laughs> We have a question here from uh, Zoom. How do you mentor the young female science students and encourage them to follow their passion? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so certainly from my perspective, it's I'm a role model. They see that I am somebody, I'm a female, I've been successful in my field, and I encourage them to not be afraid to ask the questions that they want to ask. Um, to again, you know, somebody tells you you can't, I mean, this was my thing. You know, just like I started debating my family early, I mean, you know, they're the ones putting the roof over your head and feeding you. And I'm like, how dare you do that? It's like, again, I don't know where that comes from. And it's the same thing with my science. It's like, yes, I didn't become a wildlife biologist, but I was certainly happy to explore ecology and soil chemistry, which ended up being great. And so it's the same thing for my female students. It's like, if somebody tells you you can't do something, prove them wrong. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's always been my approach. It's like, I'll show you. Um, and I don't say it and I don't get angry and I don't get divisive or, or any of those things. But it's like there's this undercurrent in myself and I'm assuming Hope Jarin and I'm assuming probably some people in this room where you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll show you and you just doggedly keep doing what you're doing if you know it's something you want to do um, and I think that's one of the other big things being a scientist means it's not about being the smartest person I will always say I'm not very smart I'm clever um, I think I have good ideas um, I think to be a good scientist means you've got to have perseverance again People are going to tell you you've got bad ideas, that they don't think you're going to succeed, you know, you name it. Um, and it's like, you just got to keep doing it if it's what you want to do. So that's what I, I tell my female mentees. Yes. Why did they, why did your professors steer you away from animal biology? So if you think about wildlife biology, wildlife biology is, again, it was like Jim Jump and remember Mutual of Omaha? You know, Merle would be back, you know, saying, well, Jim is like wrestling an alligator right now. You know, like, <laughs> looks like Jim's having a little bit of a problem. You know, it's like, whoa. And it's like, because that was the image of what a wildlife biologist was. And that how could we women wrestle an alligator? And I mean, it kind of got a point, right? I mean, again, I was able to work with large animals because I grew up milking cows and, you know, I spent a lot of time in the bush and the woods and, you know, I could handle myself. But when you think about being a wildlife biologist with that as sort of the background, it's like wrestling animals is hard and you've got to be big and strong typically, or you got to figure out a more clever way to do it. You know, what's the approach? Um, and so that's part of it. I also was interested in um, concert, being a conservation officer. And so if you think about it, being a conservation officer means 
you're going out to check on people's fishing licenses and hunting licenses. What do they have with them? Yeah. They got guns. And typically you're on your own in the middle of nowhere. And if you walk up and tell a group of hunters, it's like, hey, let me see your permits. You know, they look at you and they're like, you know, there's a couple of outcomes that are probable. Um, and so one of the reasons to dissuade females, women from being conservation officers associated with wildlife conservation in that way is that we know what men are like, um, especially men who have, you know, been out with their buddies and they've got guns. So again, I mean, I don't think it was a sort of a malicious intent saying you're not capable, but it's like you're going to be putting yourself into a very precarious, dangerous, potential dangerous situation. Um, and I think we still do face that. I mean, that we have um, uh, over the past few years really come to understand the discrimination, not only discrimination, but the harassment and assault that has happened in field situations. So when you have field students, uh, graduate students, women who you send out to the field, depending on who they are and who they're with, um, there are lots of instances where there have been assaults. Um, and so right now, I mean, all universities are undergoing, you know, what are the reporting mechanisms in place? And, and it's only been recently that some of these high profile um, lab leaders, men, have been, you know, brought to bear justice where they've actually been fired from their academic positions because they allowed that kind of harassment or were the perpetrator themselves. So it's again, it's, uh, it's, you have to face the realities when you're in those positions. I fortunately never ever experienced that. I don't know why, um, you know, but, but some people have certainly faced it. So from my professor's positions, they're like, we, you know, I, I don't know what their thought process was, but perhaps it was like, we really don't want you to be exposed to that. Could have been part, part of their process. Yeah. Can I ask one last question and then we're gonna, then we're gonna break up. Um, when you were reading Lab Girl, which was your favorite? Was it the part of the story where Hope was telling about her life? or the chapters that were interspersed that were focused on the body? Um, I guess I was, the parts that, I have to say, I skimmed over the botany because I know that, so I really didn't pay attention. <laughs> I was like, oh, let's go, yeah, yeah, I know that. Okay, so I skimmed over that. So for me, Lab Girl, as a scientist, as a female scientist, you know, her description of meeting Bill and this crazy guy that was the, for me, that was the best part of the book, mm -hmm. you know, and going through all the pieces. Oh, and also the other really fun part was like the, um, <laughs> as, as people who work with students, remember her story about they were on the, the, it loaded up the van and they're heading up to, I can't remember, it was California or something, you know, and then the weather was getting bad and she's like, no, we're going forward. First of all, I would be like, hell no, we're not going forward. You know, we're ice storm, we're stopping, you know, and I certainly would not have put a grad student behind the wheel. That's my own. I mean, you can talk to my students. Stephen Kovari will tell you, uh, yeah. So I, I am A, protective of my students, but I also don't trust them behind the wheel. Um, and uh, I will not put them in those kind of positions. I have a huge safety procedure. Um, so those were the pieces of the book I really, really enjoyed. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.